We are going to preach the shortest sermon in the history of Bayside this weekend so you can get home and enjoy those hot dogs that are waiting for you in 3,000 degree heat. So, so we want to end the service. We're going we're gonna to actually pray for Houston. How many think that we need to pray for Houston? Amen. We are going to pray, whether it's National Prayer Day or not, Baysiders pray. And we're going to do more than pray because the Baysiders do more than pray, right? And then also what we're going to do is we're going to end our habit series with just a time of prayer. So right, we just, and I want to just encourage you, don't, don't, no one get up. No one, no one get up. When we go to the time of prayer, we're just going to be about five or six minutes and we're going to just sit here and we're going to pray one for another. Is that all right if we pray for each other in church? Because we can talk about this stuff all we want. Unless God helps us, it, it's not going to work. Give me an amen if you agree with that. So last week, um, Andrew told me that he told all of you that I was going to preach a short sermon. And then he said in front of everyone that it would be the first miracle at Bayside if I was... <laughs> And so I am accepting that challenge, and I'm going to preach a short sermon, and I'm going to preach it without an accent so you'll understand every single word of it. <laughs> yeah, you could tell him I said that. <laughs> Before I do that, though, I want you to look at your sermon notes on the back here where it says the voice. How many here have ever had a big decision and you couldn't figure out what God wanted you to do? How many here have ever like, felt like you were praying, but God was behind a big cloud going, try to find my will, and he was just hiding from you? <laughs> Do you ever have that happen? Sometimes decisions get really hard, and it's hard to hear the voice of God. It's hard to know what to do. So what we're going to do, especially right now at the beginning of the school year, we're going to jump into a verse-by-verse -verse study of several key passages that actually teach us how God speaks and how do you make a decision uh, um, that's in the will of God. And we're going to start off next week on this campus with a little-known preacher, a young rookie named Chris Brown. So Chris will be here. Now, if, if you've not heard Chris yet, um, believe me, that woo that you just got, that's a legit woo. He's, uh, he's incredible Bible teacher, storyteller, no shoe wearing preacher of glory. And uh, you got to come and hear Chris Brown and bring a friend with you. Give me an amen if, if you think Chris, you got to bring a friend for Chris Brown. It's going to be amazing. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the sermon. We're going to actually just have two points in this sermon, but they're important points. And they start off with an understanding, an attitude that we have to bring to those points. The attitude is best illustrated by Henry LaGuardia. Does anyone know who LaGuardia is? LaGuardia Airport's name after him. He was the mayor of New York during the Great Depression. Now, LaGuardia was known, he was a short little man, four foot five inches, and he always wore a flower in his lapel. And he was known as Little Flower, which was kind of actually a satirical nickname because he was a force to be reckoned with. I mean, this guy had more leadership than any 100 humans, and he would actually have all these incredible stories about how we'd go into situations and absolutely change them. One of those stories is he went to the night court one night. One night he couldn't sleep, gets up, he goes to night court, and he tells the judge, you have the night off, I'm going to be the judge tonight. Here it is, right in the middle of the Great Depression, he starts hearing case after case after case as the judge, and finally, the shop owner comes up, and he says, your honor, this woman stole a loaf of bread from me. He looked at the woman, he said, he said ma'am, why did you steal a loaf of bread? And she said, I didn't know what else to do. She, she said, my, my, my daughter's husband, my son-in-law, he was providing for us and one night he, he just left and now I have three children and, and, and a, a three grandchildren and a daughter to feed. And she said, sir, I am so sorry. I beg for your forgiveness. LaGuardia turned to the, to the shop owner and he said, would you forgive this woman? He said, he said, I can't. If I actually let her get away with this, the, the rumor will spread and I'll be stolen out of my store. There's, there's no way I can do that. And the judge looked right at her and he said, ma'am, the law is the law and I have to punish you as judge. And the fine is $10. She said, I don't have $10. She said, I know. And that's when he pulled out his wallet and he paid her fine for her. And he said, furthermore, I am going to hold everyone in this court in contempt of the court for living in a city where a grandmother has to steal to, pay, to feed her children and grandchildren. He said, I'm fining each and every police officer, each and every plaintiff, each and every lawyer in this room right now, 50 cents. That woman went to court that night expecting to go to jail for a fee, she, for a penalty she couldn't pay. And instead, she went home with $57.50 .50 in her pocket. Oh, you got to amen more than that if we're going to get through this sermon. We're going fast, but we've got time for a good amen. 
Because that story rocked. Turn to your neighbor and say, that just changed my life. Because that, my friend, is a story that perfectly illustrates the grace of God. Listen to me. Nothing we've taught on habits works unless you understand the grace of God. This is the definition of grace. Grace is everything. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Don't you love that? Here's what Andrew led off last week, and this is such a powerful passage. One of my favorites in all of the Bible, Titus 2, 11 and 12. You should memorize this. This is a foundational verse. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us. Grace is the thing that teaches us. Ongoing, ongoing. It teaches us what? To say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. In other words, without the teacher of grace, you can't say no to what you want to say no to, and you can't say yes to what you should say yes to. Grace is the most powerful and effective teacher. Why? Because it's the power of gratitude. Think about that woman. For the rest of her life, if LaGuardia had asked her for anything, if it was within her power, she would have given him all things. Her devotion to him was powerful. Why? Because she was motivated by the grace. He withheld the punishment that she owned and he gave her what she did not own. This is what our God does for each and every one of us. He has mercy for what he should give you and he has grace for what you don't deserve. And when you understand that God has has given you all that you need, even to the forgiveness of sin, even to the death of his son, you become grateful for God. Amen. And that gratitude is the only power. Fear won't do it. Shame won't do it. Guilt won't do it. Con condemnation won't do it. What teaches us to say no is the grace of God. I am preaching so much better than you're amening right now. I'm telling you, <laughs> I don't know if you have heat stroke or not. And I know we're still in the introduction, but this is darn good theology. Give me an amen. amen. So in that attitude of grace, you still with me? We've got to bring that into what we're talking about. Because if we don't, it can just sound like we're saying do better. Do better doesn't work. Do these four habits. Do better. Do better doesn't work. You have to bring grace to these habits. What are the habits? Well, Andrew covered two last week, and he was talking about actually that incredible period in Jesus' life before his ministry started. What did Jesus do in the 91% of his life before his ministry started? Well, he did two things. He grew in the habit of wisdom, the Bible tells us, and he grew in the habit of health in his relationships and literally every way he grew in wisdom and in health. I want to look at actually the habits that started his ministry that actually get carried on throughout. So we had last week what happened before his ministry. This week we're going to talk about the two dominant habits. If you were to say, what did Jesus do over and over and over again? These were the two that I would list at the very top. If we're going to emulate who Jesus is. In other words, we want to know what he said. But more than what Jesus said, we want to look at and do what Jesus did. Right? Give me an amen if you agree with that. We want to do what he did. If you were going to look at the habits of Jesus, right from the very beginning of his ministry, there's two dominant ones, and there are point three and four in this making habits message. So one, growing in the habit of wisdom. Two, growing in the habit of health. Right three in, growing in the habit of proximity. What do I mean about the habit of proximity? Um, how many here have ever been camping before? Raise your hand if you've been camping. See, I love camping, but I don't know why. I, I don't know why, because it's dirty, it's filthy. I don't like outhouses or digging latrines. I don't like using leaves for toilet paper. Give me an amen if you're honest. I do not like burnt food that's frozen on the inside. Come on, give me an amen on, on this one. And I always go places where the mosquitoes are as, low, as large as my children. Have you ever been to that place? before, and somehow I go back because at the time it's a fine and pleasant minis misery, but later on I, I think, and I wonder, and I realize what happened is, is that camping causes bonding. Camping causes relationships to go so much better. And it's not just the actual camping, it's getting there, it's the road trip. When you're on a road trip, you can't fake who you are after about four or five hours. How many here have ever been on a road trip and you're like, I can't believe I'm locked in a car with these people. So, so here's the things you learn on a road trip. You learn who has horrible taste in music, give me an amen. 
Um, you, you actually learn who's got Cheeto breath uh, and other, other smells that won't be mentioned because I'm in a pulpa right now. You learn who's got a, um, a bladder the size of a kidney bean. You learn that. You're like, you are a six foot tall man and we have to stop every 20 minutes for you. You see, you can't be someone different when you're locked in a small space. When you're close to people, you become who you really are. And then in that, there's an opportunity for change. Jesus practiced closeness. That's why he came from heaven to earth. That's why he died for our sins. Every single thing that Jesus did from the garden to his ministry was about getting us closer. It was about proximity. Here's a deep theological question you have to ask yourself. Why didn't Jesus march into Jerusalem from the very beginning and get the crucifixion over with? Why spend three and a half years with the disciples? How come he didn't march, march right into Jerusalem, start doing miracle after miracle, start saying thing after thing that made the authorities upset with him and crucified him? Why delay? the crucifixion? Why sit there for three and a half years knowing it was coming? Well, the answer is simple. He waited three and a half years because he knew that is how long it would take to change the apostles. He had a camp. He had to go on a road trip. Because you and I don't change our habits quickly or easily, but we can change if we'll get closer to him and closer to one another. You see, you gotta ask this question. What did Jesus do? What did he really actually do? And the first thing he did is he gathered a small group. I want you to look at John 1, 38 through 42. There's a ton of passages we could talk about to prove this point, but this one in John, I really love it. The context here is uh, uh, some of Jesus' apostles started off as teammates of John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist goes, hey, Jesus is the guy, I'm canceling my team, go join his team. Now, a few of them had a problem with this. Nathaniel, for instance, he was one of John the Baptist's disciples. He went and sat under a fig tree. But a couple of them, including Andrew, were like, okay, we're on it. We're going to go join team Jesus. We're going to get really close to Jesus. And here's what it says about that in John 1, 38 through 42. It says, they, Andrew and some of John the Baptist's old disciples, said, Rabbi Jesus which means teacher, where are you staying? Isn't it interesting? Their first question is, what hotel are you in? (laughs) What what, what guest house are you staying in? We want to get right there. Come, he replied, and you will see. I love that answer. Jesus doesn't say, hey, give me a call. I'll have my girl call your girl. We'll make it. No, he says, no, right now, come, come. And you're going to see some stuff that you never thought you would see. So they went. And they saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So they spent a day with him, and Andrew becomes convinced. Now, look at you got to know the characters here. Andrew is the younger brother of Simon, who later gets the nickname Peter. And we're going to figure out how that happens right now. So Andrew, he's all on board. Andrew's on the team. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, it says, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. Now, now, now stop. Don't think about this with your church eyes, if you're a churchgoer. I, I, I want you to just think about this like a normal human. So, <laughs> so you have a younger brother, and the younger brother says, I'm quitting the fishing business. Why? Because I'm going to go join this guy named John the Baptist who only eats bugs. You're already going like, mom, you spoiled him. Mom, you ruined him. And then you're on that team for a while and you come to your brother and say, I quit that team. Um, That wasn't the Messiah, but now I've really found the Messiah. Who is he? He's a carpenter from Galilee and I want you to meet him. I guarantee you the only reason that Simon comes to this meeting is because the mother said, go get your brother out of that cult. And then it even gets weirder. Watch this. So Simon's not convinced at all. In fact, he doesn't get convinced for another chapter. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon. He tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him. Now, now here's the thing. They walk in the room and Jesus doesn't do any of the nice social things. He doesn't go, hey, Andrew, oh, you brought your brother with you. Hi, I'm Jesus, the Messiah. He doesn't do any of that. <laughs> Simon walks in the room. Watch what Jesus does. Jesus looked at him and said, 
You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means translated as Peter. So Simon walks to the room and he says, you, you got the wrong name. Oh, I know your name, it's Simon. Wrong name. Your mom, your dad, messed up. <laughs> You're Peter. You're a rock, dude. And Andrew's like, yeah, for brains. He's, uh, yeah, my brother. He's... What's going on here? Here's the right question. How did Jesus transform the disciples? Three things, and these are the exact same three things he wants to do in your life. Number one, by invitation. There, there's, there's a stepping off point. There's a crossing the line point. It's, it's the challenge to leave behind. Now, some of you have experienced this. Some of you actually have experienced this. But here's what I've discovered in my life as someone who's followed for more than two decades. Every once in a while, you've got to remake the decision. Every once in a while, you've got to go, what am, I, what am I leaving behind to follow Jesus? And some of you, you have not experienced this yet. And that's okay. And we love you. And we're, we're so glad you're here. But I guarantee you, Jesus will look you in the eye someday. And he'll say, leave that behind. Follow me. The second one is a call to involvement. It's the challenge to contribute. From the very beginning, Jesus says, come on, come on, let's go see this together. He's just super inclusive and he's super empowering. I mean, just a couple chapters later, he looks at him and says, all right, I want you guys to go out in my name and do all the stuff that I do. I mean, they don't understand who he is, what his mission is. Their theology is whack. They're immature. They're, there's still power struggles in them. Jesus doesn't care. Jesus puts us out there way before we're comfortable. If you're waiting to get perfect before you jump in, you'll never jump in. The Jesus way is to throw you in the water and watch you swim. And then a couple chapters after that, he sends out 72 others. And the last one is the question of identity. This is a challenge to rethink who I really am. The second we start getting proximity with Jesus, close with Jesus, he starts challenging us. He says, you can't define who you are. You have no idea who you are. And this world shouldn't define who you are. And your spouse shouldn't define it. And your background shouldn't de define it. And your parents shouldn't define it. And even your failure shouldn't define it. The only one who has the right to give you a nickname that actually means something is Jesus. And he insists on being the definer of our name. And all of that happens when we're close with each other. You know, it's a super interesting thing to do biblically is to ask the question, where did Jesus spend his time? How did Jesus make up his schedule? If you look at the cha challenge, <clears throat> these three challenges, and you say, who is Jesus doing these challenges with? The vast majority of Jesus' time, if this is all of the people in Jesus' life, the vast majority of Jesus' time is spent with just 12 people, the apostles. In fact, scholars have said that at the time that Jesus was crucified, he was only influencing directly 100 to 300 people. He had a very small following at that point, and the biblical record says that the vast majority of his time was spent with the apostles. And of the apostles, he actually spent more time with three of them. And of the three, one of them is called the disciple of whom Jesus loved. Jesus had favorites. Jesus made choices, and he invested in a few so that he could reach the many. Now, there was a whole group of ones that the Bible calls disciples. And those disciples actually learned some. They were kind of in that circle, but most of his time is with the apostles. And then there was a whole other group that followed him. These were his fans. They're not really dedicated to him. They're looking for bread and a meal. And then there's another large group, many of them that didn't even know he existed, not heard the news. It's called the multitudes. Jesus didn't hate the multitudes. He didn't ignore them on purpose, but he knew the way to change the multitudes was to to change a few. Jesus actually, I had someone come to me once time, they said, oh, you guys with your small groups, you can't find small groups in the Bible. Small groups is actually something we've made up in the modern church. I'm like, yeah, that's true, unless you study Jesus. <laughs> this is why we emphasize small groups. You guys, we spend so much time worrying about what this group thinks about us, and they don't even know you exist. This is where you need to spend your time. By the way, business people, this works in your business as well. If you start solving all your problems up here, you'll never run out of problems to solve. You'll never get on mission. You gotta actually figure out who are the people you're gonna develop here that will be the people that develop the people that develop the people that develop the people. That's what you gotta do. And it works in families too. You run around every single distant family member here. You gotta pour into the family members that God has made a priority in your life right here. 
How did Jesus spend his time? He spent his time with the few. Put the circle up screen up there. That's why we keep talking about joining a small group. If you're not in a small group, please text that number. Get into a circle up group, which brings us to our last point. Go ahead and write it in. It's growing in the habit of prayer. We debated whether we should call this the habit of aloneness or the habit of solitude or the habit of God. And I was like, those are just too, I don't know, my brain is less esoteric than that. I just want us to get one positive habit. And, it's, and I know it's not genius and no one's going to be, you know, Kurt said that we should pray. That's, I've never heard that before. <laughs> no one's going to be tweeting that. But here's the thing. This is the way you change your life. Let's look at the context of this little passage, Mark 1. I love this passage. The context is this. Jesus goes and he preaches at this, at this uh, synagogue. And the service goes extremely well. And he walks out of the service with his buddy. He's got his crew there. And the very first thing they do is they go to one of the buddy's houses and, and they go to eat. How many here love to eat right after church? Uh, aren't you glad that's in the Bible? It's in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus preached, then he went to go grub. Get your Denny's on, friends, or you're not following scripture. I mean, this, this, this is awesome. I mean, the sign that the Holy Spirit is moving in our, call, in our church is that if you're hungry afterwards, that's really the sign of it. So he and his buddies, they go to eat. There's only one problem. They show up at the house, and guess what? The mom is sick, and everyone knows Thomas, the tax collector, cannot make hors d'oeuvres. So they got to heal the mom. So, so Jesus goes in. He lays hands on the mom. The mom gets uh, healed. She gets up, and this is what the Bible says. Mark chapter 1, you read it. And she starts cooking for them so they can eat right after church. The whole city hears about this and a few hours later Jesus opens the front door of the house and the entire city has shown up on the doorstep and said heal me, heal me, heal me and he doesn't step back he doesn't, he doesn't hide from them in the moment where an entire city needs him to be powerful without hesitation he walks out the front door starts laying hands on people left and right healing, delivering and spreading the grace and mercy of God and every single person who had a need is touched how Is Jesus so ready for that moment? How is it that in a moment's notice, the performance pressure doesn't make him fall back, it makes him force his way in and heal people? Why did he have so much power? The answer is the very next verse. Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Man, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do I? If Jesus made that a habit of his, I, I think we've lost daily devotions. I think, I think we've kind of seen it as, uh, you know, optional. I think we've made excuses. We've got all sorts of things occupying our time. We've got phones that bring us every headline, but we hardly ever actually take the time to bring those headlines to Christ. Are you having a time with God every day? Jesus needed to. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. In other words, they were like, what you did last night, that was awesome, that was incredible, that was amazing, and they made us brunch, Jesus. Come on, come on, there's kosher bacon. I mean, they wanted him to stay. Look at what Jesus says. He doesn't go back to the past success. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. In other words, he had an idea of what the Lord wanted him to do with the next step. This is why, circle the word why, I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This short little four verse passage is so powerful. How do I unleash the power of prayer in my life? How can I right now actually experience the power of prayer? The first thing you gotta do, fill this in, is you have to be like Jesus. You have to find a place. If I were to ask you to write down right now, where's that place that you pray? And I highly recommend that you do it in the same place every single day. And I recommend you do it in the morning. I know people said, well, some I do better at night. I have found that if I don't start the morning with prayer, I often go the entire day without praying and I skip it at night. Do this one habit and things can 
change for you. Pick a place in your bed, in your car, in your closet, your kitchen table, your bathroom. Do you remember when we talked about keystone habits? Do you remember the keystone habits? The, the keystone habit is the one small win, that one small habit that takes down four or five bad habits. You don't have to change your whole life, my friend. Get in the presence of God. Find a place where you can put on the grace of God new every day. Find a place where you can kneel before God and say, your mercies are new every morning. Here I am, God. Yes. This one habit, this keystone, it'll take down four or five bad habits. And once you've got a place in your life, I just, I just, high schoolers, please do this for me. It's too late for all these old people. <laughs> it's hopeless. If you'll do this, your homework will go better. Every high school drama will go better. Every temptation, every peer pressure, every bit of insecurity, start your day with Jesus. He cares about you more than anyone else cares about you. And when you understand how deeply he cares about you, there's nothing anyone can say about you that'll get you off track. Find your place. Lock it in now. If you're over 35, don't, 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 don't you wish you would have locked it in when you were 16? Yes. Lock that place in. And then second, once you lock the place in, you're going to find a plan. People that meet with Jesus know their next step. He's rarely gonna tell you the five next steps. He doesn't do it that way, but he'll tell you the next step. He'll tell you the next step. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, let's go back. And he says, no, we've gotta move forward. Let's go to the next village. Wouldn't it be nice to know every next step? You can, if you get in the place, and this is the final one and it's so important. It's so important. In that place where God gives you the step or the plan, you're gonna find your true purpose. I'm not talking about even just your gift. I'm not talking about what you should be doing in this season. I'm talking about why you were knit in your mother's womb. I'm talking about why you're important. I'm talking about why you were worth dying on the cross for Jesus Christ. I'm talking about knowing that God made you on purpose, that you're not an accident, that you're not ugly, that you're not second rate, that when Jesus said it is finished, he was talking about your sins because he wanted to be in heaven with you. I'm talking about remembering the free freedom that he bought for you every single day and knowing that that freedom was purchased for a purpose, that you exist for a reason. I can't tell it to you. You won't hear it from me. Your mom can't tell you. Your dad can't tell you. Your spouse can't tell you. Why? Because you'll never hear it from us the way you'll hear it from your creator. You've got to hear it from God himself. That's when it sticks. That's when it changes your habits. My, my friend, if Jesus needed to say that is why, how much more do you and I need to find our why? I was reading this incredible article this week about a young, uh, not young, she's mid, mid-age now. Her name's Chi Yong. She's a uh, Chinese gal, and, and she's known in her little village as Sister Wedding Gown because every single day she wears her wedding dress. Every day she puts it on for a couple hours. And she walks around the village. And when she first did this, people said, oh, it's a fad. It'll wear off 10 years she's been married now. And every single day she's put on her wedding dress. A reporter came and interviewed her because he thought she might be disturbed. It would be a funny little story. And he asked her, why do you put on your wedding dress every single day? And she said, oh, the answer is very easy. You see, at age 18, I was sold into slavery. And for 10 long years, I was abused every single day. A woman in the village where I was being held took a great risk. She snuck in in the night and she released me from my prison. She told me that if I would go to another little nearby village, her son was waiting there and he would guide me out of the region and to freedom. Sure enough, she made the treacherous trek. She met the sun and the sun guided her to a region where she could be free. Along the road, something amazing happened. She fell in love with the sun and the sun fell in love with her. Shortly thereafter, they were married. 
And she said, that's why I put on my wedding dress every day because I was a slave and now I'm free because I was a captive and the door of the jail has been opened because I had no hope and now I'm loved and alive and I never want to forget what I've come from. So I put on this dress every day. My friends, every time we bow before God in the habit of prayer, we put on the cloak of his grace. We say, I was a slave and I was set free. I was blind and now I see. I had no future and then my future was purchased for me. I came in expecting jail and I left with riches in my pocket because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. Would you bow your heads for me right now? Yes, we praise you, Lord. Bow your heads with me. We're not done. We're going to pray right now, but we want to just go all of us into a prayer. Father God, let your grace flow in this place. We're not saying that we can do it. We're not saying that we will just try harder. What we're saying, God, simply, truly, is we need you. We need your grace. Let it teach us right now that every habit, you can break them. And every good habit, you can make them. Jesus, move. We ask it in your name.